Dr. Leah back there. Um, all year we're talking about the greatness of God. And today we're continuing a sermon series called Encounters with God in the Bible. Man, my slides, I had some good slides that I was prepared to do this morning. Oh, well, that's all right. For, for, for you visual learners, I apologize. Well, at any rate, we're, we're, we're going through a sermon series called Encounters with God. And in the Bible, when God appears to someone, it's known as a theophany or a divine appearing. And these encounters are wild stories. They're full of surprises. God never seems to act how we would expect him to act. But these stories reveal the stunning character of who God is and his heart for a world that is lost without him. Well, today we'll consider a fascinating encounter with God in the book of Job. And Job is famous in the Bible for what he suffered. Because the book of Job is a series of dialogues dealing with the nature and purpose of suffering. Now, this is a topic that human beings have wrestled with forever. As far back as we have a written record, we find people wrestling with the issues of pain and suffering in the world. Now, whether you have wrestled with this topic in your life or not, one day you will too. So many of the answers to suffering have to do with what you believe about who God is and what God does in this world. This is vitally important for us to have as a conversation. Now, this morning, we're going to do something that I've never done before. I'm not totally convinced it's going to work. It's my little experiment. But I'm going to preach through the whole book of Job. <clears throat> now, before you leave, we're not going to read through it all. So, uh, although I'd encourage you to do so maybe this week. But it's necessary to have the whole book in order to understand or at least have a working understanding of the flow of the whole book in order to understand the theophany at the end when God shows up. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, please take it and open to Job 1 verse 1. It's spelled job. If you're not familiar with the Bible, that's okay. You can look it up in the table of contents. We call it, we pronounce it Job. Job 1 verse 1, and we'll unpack this as we go. So we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And no, we're not putting it up on the screen for you, apparently. Sorry about that. <laughs> Verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Whoa. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Okay, let's pause here. So first, what kind of man is Job? <laughs> he's an amazing man. Job is, is uh, an exemplary man. He's, he's a, an extremely wealthy man. That's what all the discussion about the donkeys and the, the herds is about. Uh, second, he was a, also a family man. He had 10 kids. And not only that, but they actually like to spend time with each other, which to me is a total parenting win in my book. Third, he was a devoutly religious man. He didn't just go to church for Christmas and Easter. I mean, he's pre presented here as a, a faithful man, blameless and upright. Not only would he offer burnt sacrifices in worship for himself, but also for his kids in case on the off chance that they might have sinned uh, in, when they were having their birthday party. Let's continue in verse 6. One day... The angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, now here in your Bibles, you, you might notice there's a footnote. If you scan down to the bottom of the page or click on the little footnote link in your app, the Hebrew word meaning that's translated Satan here uh, has a meaning of the accuser or the adversary. Okay, so the adversary, Satan, came with them, the other angels. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. 
Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Imagine if that was God's assessment of your life. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to the adversary, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So here, the Bible presents Satan, the devil, in a matter-of-fact way. He just is. But with probably fewer details than any of us would, be, would want. <laughs> he's a, this is a curious character. But here he's presented as an angel who is named the accuser or the adversary. That's what Satan means. And here the accuser says that the only reason that Job is such a good guy, the only reason that he's blameless and upright is because he has such a blessed life. He has suffered so little. He has health, he has wealth, he has influence, he has prosperity, he has everything that you could want in life. And so God allows him, Satan, to afflict Job's circumstances, but he says, don't harm him. So after this, we have a series of the worst kind of calamities that any, any one of us could imagine. One after another, a series of messengers comes to Job's doorstep with the news of tragedy beyond comprehension. All at once, his vast wealth and many servants were taken from him by multiple attacks of, of enemy raiders and, and also in a fire. Also, his beloved children were killed when the house collapsed in a storm when they were eating dinner together. Now, any one of these events would be enough to bring you to your knees with grief. All of his wealth, all of his children. How does Job respond? Well, in the story, Job exhibits a, a poise, a calm acceptance that is remarkable. He is somehow able to worship the Lord in the midst of the depth of his grief. Well, after this, the adversary makes another appearance before God and accuses Job of responding in this way only because he himself wasn't suffering. Maybe Job is especially self-centered, and it doesn't really matter to him if his wealth is taken from him or if his children pass away in this tragic way. Well, God allows Satan to afflict Job physically, but not to take his life. So Job not only loses his wealth and his children. But now he's covered with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. He's so physically miserable that this, in this disease that Job, it says that Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His skin just seems to be melting off and he can just scrape it off as he sits in the dust. Here is a man who is absolutely wrecked. What more could he have to possibly suffer? Now I know that this is a, an ancient story and it's hard to connect with these reports of the herds and, and the skin disease, but have you ever felt like this? That things couldn't get worse couldn't possibly get worse in your life. What a discouraging place to be. However, it's here that we come to the main portion of the book of Job, which is a series of dialogues on the nature and the purpose of suffering and what, if anything, God has to do with it. So in the rest of the whole book, we get five different perspectives, okay? 
First, we get the perspective of Job's wife, Job's poor wife. Second, we get the perspective of Job's friends, miserable comforters they are. Third, we get Job's own perspective in his responses back to his friends. Fourth, we get the perspective of Elihu, a young man. And finally, in our theophany of God himself. So, let's take these five answers in turn, covering about 40 chapters of Job. First, Job's wife. So, in Job chapter 2, verse 9, we get his wife's brief response to his suffering and her suffering. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. (laughs) Whoa. Okay. Not in the mood to have a friendly discussion, apparently, says Job's wife. Well, no, I got to say, I shouldn't be too quick to condemn her because, after all, she's been through everything Job has been through. She lost all of her wealth. She lost all of her children, too. She isn't physically afflicted by this disease that Job is suffering from, but she's wrecked herself. And in the midst of of what had to be just crushing grief, her response to Job is to curse God and die. Now, at first blush, this sounds pretty insensitive, but actually this reveals a perspective on the, the nature and the purpose of suffering that is probably the most widely shared perspective among people today. You see, to curse God is the opposite of blessing or worshiping God. So in other words, Job's wife is basically saying, turn away from God. Give up on God. Why? Because, and here's our first perspective, suffering is meaningless. There is no truth here or justice here or hope here. There is only misery in this brief life. At one point, Wesley from The Princess Bride says, life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Wesley knew what Job's wife was feeling. Religion won't help. It's only a delusion that will mask the reality of suffering. Now, she doesn't say this here But the typical result of this type of thinking, this type of nihilistic or naturalistic thinking that suffering is just meaningless, it's just a part of life, is to turn instead to hedonism or the pursuit of happiness. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. You see, if suffering is meaningless, then we just need to enjoy what we can while we can because this life is all we get. This response to suffering, which does make sense if you believe that suffering is meaningless, is seen repeatedly throughout human history. We see it in ancient Greek philosophy. We see it in modern philosophy. I see this perspective all the time among modern people today. The belief is something like this. Life is short. Life is hard. So do what makes you happy. But is this the truth? Is suffering truly meaningless? Okay, so that's the first perspective shared in the book of Job. Frankly, it doesn't get as much attention in the book of Job, but it might be the perspective shared by most of the people you and I know today. All right, second perspective. At the end of chapter 2, Job's three friends show up, and then from chapters 3 through chapters 31, chapter 31, Job engages in a series of dialogues with them. Now, as you read through it this week, hopefully, you'll you might be a bit frustrated because their dialogues seem to go nowhere. And you're right. We get nowhere. But you see, Job's friends heard what he was going through. They heard all the calamity that came into his life and how deeply he was suffering. And so they came to him, which is nice, and they were trying to comfort him. Again, that's nice. That's a good thought. But then they say things that might be true to a degree, but certainly aren't helpful. They tell Job, and here's our second perspective, that suffering is justice. Suffering isn't meaningless. Suffering is justice. After all, good people, innocent people prosper, right? Doesn't God bless good people? 
So Job must be a truly miserable sinner for how much he's suffering here. How comforting would that be if one of your friends said that to you? In fact, in an especially cruel moment, I forget which one, maybe Bildad, the Shuite, he said, uh, Job probably deserves worse than he's getting. If suffering is the punishment for your sin, then their solution, which is repeated again and again, is, Job, you need to repent and find relief from your, from your suffering. Repent of your sin and God will alleviate your suffering. If you turn from your sin, he will bless you. But from the beginning, it's really clear that Job is this exemplary guy. I mean, he is, he's not this obviously wicked man. There isn't some secret terrible sin that he's been hiding. And so in the end, Job calls them miserable comforters for their comfort is really condemnation. You're suffering because you sin, Job. Repent. Now, just a brief note here. If, you, if you're ever in a situation where you're with a friend or family member who's suffering or going through a process of grieving and you don't know what to say, not the best time to shoot from the hip, okay? You don't have to say anything, in fact. It might be better for you just to be there and sit with your friend or family member and pray for them. Don't be like Job's friends is what I'm trying to say. Now, the truth is, is that sometimes the innocent prosper, but sometimes they suffer too. Sometimes the wicked seem to prosper. But again, this is a very common perspective. People, people, a lot of people today think that we basically get what we deserve. Now, sometimes suffering is a consequence of sin. That is true. If you get in, injured in a car accident, when you were driving under the influence, the injury is a consequence of your sin. But if someone else is injured in the accident, it's not necessarily a consequence of their sin, right? So is suffering justice? Well, it seems like life is a bit more complicated than that. However, this is one possible reason why suffering isn't meaningless. Sometimes suffering may be justice. Okay, third perspective. We get our third perspective from Job's response to his friends. And his response is the opposite. If you, you could probably guess that was coming. Our third perspective is this. Suffering is unjust. Suffering is unjust. We don't get what we deserve all the time. In many places in his dialogue, Job essentially asks... Why do bad things happen to good people? Why have I suffered so much when I have tried so hard to be a good person? This isn't fair, Job is saying, crying out. Suffering is unjust. Now, Job is all over the place in his responses. He's up and then he's down. He is, and understandably so, He's emotional in his pain and suffer, suffering and his loss. One minute he affirms his faith and his hope in God, and the next minute he questions the wisdom of God in even allowing him to be born, given what he would suffer. Again and again, Job says that he has sought to be a good man. Now, if his statements are even close to accurate, he was probably a better man than most people. He says he had not trusted in his vast wealth. He didn't put his money in the place of God. He, in fact, used his wealth to care for those in need. He cared for the widow. He cared for the orphan. He cared for the foreigner. He cared for the poor. He had used his strength and his wealth and his resources to fight injustice. He was faithful to his wife. He had, he had determined not to even look inappropriately at another woman. He did not offer sacrifices to idols, but regularly offered sacrifices for himself and other people, including his kids. How could God stay silent when Job suffered this way? Have you ever felt like that? 
Have you ever prayed that prayer? I read the Bible. I pray. I go to church. I give. I serve. I do what is right. And yet I'm hurting. I am suffering and desperate in need. Where is God in my pain? Did he not see how I was living my life before? Does he not care for me now? Can God even be good while suffering exists? C.S. Lewis wrote a helpful book on this problem called The Problem of Pain all the way back in 1940. But then 20 years later, his wife, Joy, died of cancer, and Lewis wrote another book called A Grief Observed. I think Lewis recognized that there are many good answers to the question of suffering. There are real truths to share, to understand the reality of suffering in this broken world. But when you are in the midst of grief or pain, it may not be the most helpful time to learn those things. Now, this is one of the reasons I think that it's helpful to have a sermon on Job so close to Thanksgiving. It's in these times, it's in the good times that we can best prepare for the hard times. Okay, we're almost done. Fourth perspective. So how far have we come here with no slides? Number one, suffering is meaningless. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you'll die. This is, this is all we get. There's no deeper purpose to suffering. Perspective number two, suffering is justice. You're getting what you deserve, so you probably have done something terrible and you should repent. Well, if Job had something to repent over, I think he should, for sure. Number three, suffering is unjust. It's a lack of justice. It's not fair. Why do bad things happen to good people? All right, fourth. The fourth come, perspective comes from a young man named Elihu, and it starts in chapter, all the way down in chapter 32. Um, if you want to flip more to the end of Job, you can. I'll give you permission now. Elihu had waited to speak. Perhaps he was recording this, these dialogues here. Perhaps he was watching. But he had waited to speak because Job and Job's friends were all older than him, and he thought that they would have some wisdom to share with him in how to deal with suffering. Now, age doesn't necessarily equate to wisdom, unfortunately. We all have growth in wisdom needed. Now, Elihu, when he finally spoke up, agrees that God is just. So he must have a just purpose behind suffering, allowing suffering to exist in the world. But Elihu says he offers another perspective, that suffering can also produce good fruit. So his perspective, the fourth perspective, is that suffering builds character. Suffering builds character. Now, this is sort of what I consider like the football coach approach to suffering. No pain, no gain. Rub some dirt on it. You're not going to get a lot of sympathy if you fall down and get a boo-boo. Pain and hardship can be crushing, but they can also serve to refine our character. Suffering can produce the fruit of strength and humility and repentance and wisdom and compassion and more. There's all kinds of good that can come out of a time of suffering. So God's work in suffering might be motivated by justice to punish sin, but God might also be motivated by love and a desire for us to grow and, ma and mature in our character and in our faith. And that's true. The Lord disciplines those he loves like a good dad disciplines their children so that they would grow, not so that they would be crushed. However, the problem with Elihu's perspective, like many young men, is he speaks the truth without love. It's like a guy that just graduated from Bible college. He's got a lot of truth, but he's not a very comforting sort of person. He says he, it says, the text says he burned with anger against Job, the one who's suffering. 
The one who lost everything. The one who has literally his skin falling and scraping off of his body. He also burned with anger at Job's friends. You know, you can be right and still be wrong. But as Elihu's anger was building, a storm was building around them. And from chapters 37, 32 through 37, we get this amazing poetic image of Elihu's anger as he is cursing out Job and his friends for their ignorance and their arrogance. And as he was speaking, we can imagine his voice raising, perhaps shouting over the wind and the thunder and the lightning and the rain of this incredible storm that had come in. And then out of the whirlwind, out of the storm, when all the other voices and perspectives and questions from human beings had ceased, God speaks. Turn to Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Uh oh. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? This continues on for about four chapters. Now sometimes God appears as a still small voice, a whisper. But here God shows up in power and majesty thundering from the midst of the storm. And for four chapters, God basically says, who are you, Job, to judge me or my plans for anything or anyone in the world? You are not ultimately just. You are not even the strongest among the creatures on the earth. Do you have insight that you think will help me or improve my plans? Do you, O oh creature, have a better perspective than your creator? Interestingly, God never really addresses the other perspectives or questions. Now, of course, there is much to say about the various perspectives on suffering that we've shared already from all over the Bible. There's a vast treasure house of wisdom in the scriptures on how to walk through pain and suffering. But here, God shows up in power. How does Job respond? My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. This is chapter 42. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What do you think Job repented of here? What do you think was his confession? Commentator Robert Alden says, quote, I prefer to say that he, Job, confessed that his God had been too small. He needed the theophany to remind him of the fact that the God of the universe and the creator of all creatures, is greater, grander, higher, and wiser than any mortal can imagine, much less challenge. I think so. Job was being obedient to a God far too small. Now, an interesting fact, in all these perspectives on suffering, one that I didn't, had never heard of before and thought of before until this past week is that no one in Job refers to God in a personal way using the name Yahweh. Only God in a general sense, never personally. 
in their dialogue, in their philosophizing about suffering. They're dealing with God at arm's length. But here, when God meets Job in the midst of his suffering, he is personal. He is called Yahweh. Now after this, the greatest rebuke and correction in the scriptures, the Lord graciously restored to Job all that he had lost. This is what God can do. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this book of Job? There is meaning in suffering, even when we can't see it. Suffering in general is is the result of sin in the world. We get that from Genesis chapter 3, but is not always a direct punishment for your sin. God allows suffering for his purposes of love and of justice, but he also has the power to limit suffering and, even better, to redeem and restore what is broken or lost. We also learn that people who are suffering, they need truth in love. They need both gentle answers to the philosophical questions and issues that come up in the response to real suffering, and they need the ministry of quiet presence. I didn't mention it, but Job's friends, when they arrived, they spent a week sitting with him in silence. That week was probably far more helpful than any word they shared after that. They needed a, they, people need a friend to sit with them, to listen to them, to love them, and bear what is sometimes a crushing burden of this broken world. Finally, and most importantly, I would say, People need a vision of God, high and lifted up, infinite in wisdom, perfect in justice, abounding in love and faithfulness. But also they need to see a God who is willing to come down, not just in the midst of the storm, not just in the midst of Job's life, but down all the way down to become a human being in the brokenness of this world, in the man Jesus Christ. People need to see Jesus as one who is willing to bear the worst suffering in his death on the cross and one who has defeated suffering once and for all through his resurrection from the dead. So today, whether we rejoice or whether we mourn, may we turn to him and trust in him He is with us. He is our comforter. He will be our restoration and our peace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we confess that sometimes suffering makes us pretty self centered. Sometimes in the midst of pain and heartbreak and loss and grief, we can become a little too obsessed with ourselves. Maybe we can stand in arrogance, in a a self-righteous posture as Job stood in judgment over you, condemning you. Father, would you forgive us? Would you humble us? Would you humble us under your mighty hand so that in due time you will lift us up. Father, it's hard to believe that. It's hard to trust in that. Would you help us by the power of your Holy Spirit and with the beautiful, glorious truth of the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection from the dead. Would you give us hope beyond pain, beyond suffering, Would you help us to trust in you and your goodness all the days of our lives? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.